Hey everybody, Kevin here. We got something super exciting to announce. Tim and I are doing our first ever giveaway and all you have to do to enter is subscribe to our Substack before August 1st. But what are we giving away? <laughs> You're gonna love this. We're talking about a mystery collectible related to the movie Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. That's right, the same Indiana Jones movie that we widely panned on this podcast. You could be the proud owner of a piece of Indiana Jones history because we don't want to be. Now, if you listen to the show, you're going to love what we got on our Substack. It's packed with even more insights, behind the scenes content, and personal weekly recommendations from me and Tim. So go on over to nerdyfor30.com, hit that subscribe button before August 1st, and get in on this incredible once in a lifetime giveaway. And most importantly, stay nerdy, everybody. the beam it's time for nerdy for 30 the podcast where we talk about nerdy ish movies for 30 ish minutes my name is kevin bauer aka the critics choice with me as always <laughs> it's my co-host tim keck the people's champ and today we are talking about a perfect movie it is spider-man 2 from the year 2003 Tim, when we talked about doing this movie on our review preview podcast, you mentioned that you had always liked the first Spider-Man more than Spider-Man 2. That surprised yeah. me. On the rewatch, do you still feel that way? I uh, didn't finish my rewatch of the first one, but rewatching the second one, I know exactly why. This movie is a downer. It is good, oh. but it is Peter Parker getting his ass kicked the whole time it is a it is a slog peter can't even get an appetizer at a party like nothing (laughs) goes well for him for 99 percent of this movie and then mary jane shows up lies to his face that she's okay with him being spider-man and then he goes off and she you know then it ends on a look of her being like Oh man, I am gonna hate this. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, like that's <laughs> like in between. There's amazing fights. Doc Ock is great, but I think especially when this came out, I found the first one more uplifting, and this one was especially as, as a younger Tim. I I had a hard time rewatching it and dealing with that emotion every time. I think. What oh about my you? god, dude! I think. It's so interesting you say that because this kind of goes back to our base understanding of Spider-Man that each of us have, which sounds like it's a little bit different. We dug into this on the Spider-Verse pods, but I had described Peter pretty much from this movie, who is a huge dweeb where the one cool thing he has going for him is that he gets to be Spider-Man, but he doesn't even usually get to enjoy that. Like in the old Spider-Man comics, The other superheroes didn't trust him. Even the public didn't trust him. His own boss, Jonah, is just trying to smear his name across all of New York City. So the one cool thing that he gets to do, he can't even fully enjoy. Nobody is singing his praises the same way they sing the praises of the Fantastic Four. But of the Fantastic Four. But for uh, your understanding of Spider-Man, it sounds like yours has always been that Peter Parker has this awesome life where all the girls in high school, for some reason, are very interested in him and want to be with him. And yet he can never make any of his commitments to his friends and his family because he has to keep saving people who are in danger. And I think this movie supports that theory, right? As soon as he stops being Spider-Man, everything's going great. He's acing his classes. The girls are into him. His dream girl is going to leave his fian- her fiance, which, by the way, pretty quick relationship. Oh, I'll yeah. just say you go from uh, him being <laughs> your the friend being like, so you have a boyfriend and she's like, I wouldn't like put a label on it to being engaged. I think a day late. Like, how does time work in this? Are we are we supposed to believe that a lot of time <laughs> passes in this movie or does everything happen? You know, the next day, as it kind of feels like it's just Dude, chopping movie- to chopping to chopping. 10 years. This movie takes place over the course of 10 years. I mean, if it took place over a year, I'd believe it. If it took place over a week, I'd believe it. And either way, the the, the whole wedding thing seems crazy. MJ seems crazy. Uh, and Peter's Peter's life is being 
fucked over by the fact that he's Spider-Man. I think it's something that makes him compelling as a character that him being a superhero is a sacrifice in a way that it's not for Thor. It's not for Iron Man. It's not for the Fantastic Four. It's not for the X-Men. Spider-Man's life is actively worse because he has to do. He feels an obligation to do something with the power he has with great power comes great responsibility. Responsibility isn't fun. It's not something to be excited about. It's just something you got to do because you got to do it. And that's what Spider-Man is for him. Not that he doesn't have a good time and he's a funny guy and he cracks jokes and goofs off. And I'm sure he likes being Spider-Man a lot, but it definitely cramps Peter Parker's style in a big way. And just because this movie supports my my thesis about the character doesn't necessarily mean that I love watching him get beat down over and over again. He also there's also a lot of things in this movie where I get it like Spider-Man is a burden on Peter Parker and it's a distraction. But why can't you tell MJ how you feel? That's like a you thing. That's not a (laughs) Spider-Man thing. There's a scene where he's given up being Spider-Man and he's just walking along being Peter Parker. Things are going great. And he sees a guy getting roughed up in an alley by two dudes. And he just like turns his back on him and walks away. (laughs) And it's like, yo, the human being Peter Parker could call for help. Could could try and fight one of the guys, like do anything. He really has taken a completely hands off approach (laughs) to helping anyone at all. There is no middle ground with him. He's, he's either Spider-Man or he is never contributing to a charity. He's never volunteering anywhere. He is never helping out another human being ever or he is Spider-Man. And I think that's a little extreme. I think there's a compromise where Peter can still be a decent human being. Uh, and when he's not Spider-Man, it's it seems like a lot of this is self-inflicted. Dude, it's in this the- movie, which I don't love. It's not all the conflict isn't all from Spider-Man. It's from Peter Parker, just kind of, I guess, the weight of being Spider-Man. He's just messing stuff up. And I don't know. It's weird. I, real quick, the the just releasing all responsibilities. It's the Andy Dwyer logic that we've talked about before, where there's that line where Andy says, I couldn't be a cop, so I have to be a robber. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. He is he's becoming uh, what he hates. He's just has to do an extreme. It's zero or 100 with Peter Parker. Why can't it be 50, Peter? Why can't we just go right down the middle? And I think maybe and, that's. That's the self-responsibility that you talk about there, too, where it sounds like you resent Peter in this movie for not just being more basically in control of his life and the decisions that he's making. And right. I am. And I'm also realizing as this is happening that this guy is a kid. He's in college. Yeah. He's like supposed to be maybe 22 in this movie. Right. Tops. Tops. And 22 year olds still kind of dumb, right? College kids can be stupid and maybe they're not the best at sharing their emotions with a girl that they're into, but also they have this dark secret and they can't tell them. And maybe that's part of the reason why he's doing dumb stuff. You know, it's because he's young and he's figuring everything out and he doesn't have answers and he's just a 22 year old kid, which seems crazy because Looking at Tobey Maguire, I'm like, this is not a 22 year old like you for I forget. I had to remind myself halfway through. Holy shit. He's 22. Right. You, Tom Holland is, looks young. Even Andrew Garfield looks young. Tobey Maguire. I'm like, this is this can't be right. How old he seems is old Tom to Holland? me for whatever reason? He I remember when these movies first came out. He looked so hilariously old. I would have guessed yeah. in Spider-Man one that he was 35 playing a high schooler. In this yeah. one, I looked it up. Toby was 28 when they were filming this, like 27, 28 when they were filming this. And watching this, this was the first time I've ever seen Toby McGuire and thought, oh, he does look kind of young. But yeah, 
it's the first time I think that I've seen him when he's been younger than me. And when he came out of the portal in Spider-Man No Way Home, I remember thinking he doesn't look that different. He looked just like this in Spider-Man 1 when he was playing a 16 year old. And yet here we go. He actually did seem a little bit younger to me in this one. Tom Holland now, this is wild. Tom Holland right now is 27. So Tom Holland is functionally the same age now that Toby was filming Spider-Man 2. So I think Toby's just an old looking guy. And Tom Holland's Spider-Man is now reaching the place story wise where it makes sense for him to be an older guy. Oh, weird. Right. Yeah. Because he's been a high schooler this whole time. And then he graduated. He was going to college. That was kind of the whole thing. So if we get another Tom Holland thing, I think it's a couple of tweaks to say some years have passed and now he's playing his age. Sure. And it makes sense if we have a, you know, a grown up Peter in a more grown up scenarios. I think that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. I also just looked it up. Andrew Garfield (laughs) was 27 when he filmed Amazing Spider-Man one. So this 27 age range, this is a a big age range, age range, big age range for spider people. I think it's the thing for high school. You're 27 and there you go. I think it's I think it's a very new thing (laughs) like in the past, like 10, 15 years, right, where they're actually casting age appropriate high schoolers Mm -hmm. where they're like, yeah, you can have a show like Euphoria where the entire cast is in 35. It's it's strange. I prefer that doesn't have its own problems, too. Yeah, there is something weird about casting these 35s and then. Just like watching them have sex on, on TV and being like, yeah, but they're high schoolers. Oh, it's, and it's like super okay, uncomfortable. This whole thing's kind of kind of creepy to me. I don't know. It's yeah, weird. It's that. a weird take. Project X had like a lot of nude scenes for a movie that was supposed to be about high schoolers. I had to Google it while I was watching the movie. I was like, is this fucking are they am I wrong? Are they supposed to be in college? Why are they doing this? Super creepy. Project X. Examine yourself. Something's you wrong. Know, I was I was thinking about that the other day, like why are why are there's there's so much glorification of these specific time periods Mm -hmm. and it's because it's nothing like the rest of your life. There's four years you're in college or however long and you're in like a small community, usually you're walking places, you have friends, you have this kind of thing that your life revolves around and then you move somewhere else and then real life just hits you in the face and you realize that there's no path, there's nothing going on. You can kind of do whatever you want and that's scary but also empowering. It's it's a real shock. But when you're in high school and you're like going to pep rallies and going to the game and you're in this like enclosed ecosystem that I think all of us kind of long for and wish we could have as adults in some level. So I think that's why they're just projecting all of this stuff. I think it's I wish I could just relive high school. So all these whatever 35 year olds are playing high schoolers because there's 35 year olds out there that want to feel like they're in high school again. And maybe that's part of it. Interesting. So you're seeing it's like wish fulfillment. I mean, I I'm think seeing there's wish fulfillment. I think that's there's an element of that that I've always picked up on from kind of screwball comedies where they will have. I mean, even like a lot of sitcoms like uh, uh, King of Queens, where they'll have this guy that has no real value. He's just kind yeah. of a schlub and he's got this just absolutely gorgeous wife. And you just wonder the whole time, like, why is she with him? Like, all he does is complain about her all the time. It's they treat her like shit exactly. in this show. But yeah, it's wish fulfillment <laughs> for the just schlubby dudes that are watching the show. Yeah. It's weird. Honestly, yeah. it reminds me, I'm in the office. Now it's like hot as balls outside in New yeah. York. It's sweaty. The subway's sweaty. And it's and all of the uh women in my in the office I work at are freezing. And it's because the AC is on. And there's a whole patriarchal societal reason why, like the men are the in charge of the company. The men want to wear suits, so they have it colder in the office. That's why Mm -hmm. offices are usually colder. And so it's easier for women to put on clothes than for men to take off a jacket. But also it's like we can meet halfway at this point. You know, there's some compromise to be had here. It seems like it's just kind of this inherent thing that eventually we'll we'll kind of kind of get out of it, I think. I don't know why I brought that up. Maybe that's a complete non sequitur. I don't know. I think it's in the same vein. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we're edging out of this and into more reasonable stuff. I do wonder if we'll get to a point where we have a Spider-Man that is Peter Parker in high school 
voiced by an actual high schooler. It's so strange now because when you see that, I remember Tom Holland in 2017 or I think his first appearance was what Civil War in 2016. I remember thinking yeah. he's so young, but he was probably age appropriate for the part at the time. Definitely. Definitely. I think he's great. Tom Holland's one of my faves. Uh, maybe maybe the best Spider-Man. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I have to do a rewatch of everything. I just I don't think Toby is. it. I think it's been improved no. every time, honestly. Yeah, I don't know if Toby's my favorite. But at the time, I remember thinking this is the perfect adaptation. Like these movies, I thought were just exactly what the character is. This is exactly who Spider-Man is. It's perfect casting. And now that we've seen it a couple of times, I'm like, I think we've gotten the formula. <laughs> we've improved on it every single time. Question for you. Yeah. Does Aunt May know that Peter Parker's Spider-Man? Totally. Totally. How? When you share a house with someone, <laughs> it's pretty hard to keep a secret as big as I am a vigilante that fights crime at night. She doesn't know at the beginning of the movie. I think she does. I think she knows the whole time. That's kind of been my reading of it is I think she's mm. always kind of been kind of like planting seeds that she knows and kind of trying to support from the background. It's like the doctor. How did you read the doctor scene this time around where Peter's like, uh, I had this dream, but actually it's uh, it's my friend had this dream and uh, uh, my friend dreams that he's Spider-Man. I thought it was really creepy and I thought nobody has this relationship with their doctor. I remember we had <laughs> we had a conversation off pod a while ago that was uh, we were talking about having your picking your primary care oh, provider. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have to notify the doctor you're picking that, like, let them know that mm. you're their like <laughs> primary care guy. <laughs> and I think I think that's pretty traditional for a doctor. I think it's a pretty transactional relationship. And I think if. I went in for an annual physical and the doctor started giving me psychological advice. <laughs> I, I would be <laughs> also the move of a doctor sitting next to him. Oh, I got to know. Insane. I don't know why. I was like, this is crazy. So, <laughs> so off putting a total breach of doctor etiquette. I mean, they need to the doctor police need to show up and rip up his certificate. I, it's completely unacceptable from a medical professional i think oh this guy is wanted by the doctor cops for sure uh <laughs> it reminded me their relationship was like how i think the relationship started between walter hobbs in the movie elf and john favreau's <laughs> doctor character where it seems like they're just dudes like they're just maybe yeah. they play poker outside of this and for some reason he knew john favreau could do a dna test for him so he just called him up because it's like is this your pcp or are you just boys yeah, they seem like boys in that. And Peter Parker seemed like boys with his doctor in this for some reason. And it's this is not reasonable for a 22 year old who is also is Spider-Man. He has a healing fact. Like, how often are you going to the doctor as Spider-Man? Fucking never. I'm going to say a lot of not. Dude. Not, a, not a lot. <laughs> a lot of not. Dude. A lot of not. That doctor knew he was Spider-Man the second he stepped in that door. That doctor sees sick people all the time. He has never seen a healthier person than Peter. Right. How many tests in? <laughs> how many tests does it take for him to realize this is Spider-Man? Oh, my God. Muscle like, muscle weighs more than fat, right? Peter steps on the <laughs> scale and he's like 600 pounds. <laughs> he, weighs, he weighs 600 pounds. I mean, the first he can never have any blood like he can't get an std test or anything no because the second they do they're going to be like you have spider chlamydia and <laughs> we don't know how this is possible <laughs> I hate to tell are you, you spider-man <laughs> the spider that bit you also had chlamydia so not only do you have the proportionate strength and speed of a spider but you also have radioactive chlamydia <laughs> and the chlamydia is actually the proportional strength of a spider. <laughs> <laughs> so the bind really just averages out to pretty, pretty, pretty general chlamydia. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just kind of a perspective thing. He really could have just framed himself as chlamydia man. <laughs> Super clap. You just the, the villains hear him coming, just clapping from a distance. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like his arch nemesis being the clap. Sure. And you hear him coming. 
Oh, speaking of hearing him coming, Doc Ock in this, so good. Oh, yeah. So awesome. So great. He gets he gets the horror movie treatment in this. I know, dude. He is treated like a monster and you hear him coming. The ground shakes. People run from him. They every time he shows up, or at least for the first half of the movie, they build up to the reveal of him every time. It is people react like he is a complete monster. It is. He is a horror monster in this movie, and it's very it's very fun. It's very cool. It's a great touch. I I'm a big fan of it. I, I It kind of makes sense now with the Sam Raimi stuff that they're he's definitely bringing a horror element to this character that I think made it just so much, so much more chef's kiss, you know, mm-hmm. delicious. Fantastic. It was so cool. It was the scene where the tentacles just slaughter everybody in the operating oh, room amazing it's horrifying it's amazing it's amazing it's so good the cgi in this i think is is in a weird place for me because at times it is so bad mm-hmm. but the blocking i think is really good like technology is the only thing holding these people back yeah. right they're not there are no mistakes in this it's just we just don't we're not able to do it. The we're restricted by the technology of our time because the blocking like the subway fight is a great example. There mm-hmm. are parts of it where it's clearly a CGI guy on a fake background swinging. But the way Spider-Man moves always makes sense. The way Doc Ock moves, even if the CGI looks bad, he is st- and, he, and his movement is so interesting because he is held up by these claws and he is just a normal guy. He's basically just a, just a meat sack being carried around by these super strong claws. Yeah. And you can see when he's climbing the building, how his body has weight and that the claws are holding it up and the claw reaches up and then his body moves and it'll look kind of out of focus and very CGI. But at the same time, it looks great. I, I was torn the, the whole time. I'm like, it, do are the effects in this really good or are they bad? I can't. I can't tell. Kevin, can you weigh in? I think they're really good. It's the exact opposite of that so one too. shot that everybody complained about. In no way home where Andrew Garfield lands with MJ and it's way too quick. You can pull this up on YouTube. A couple of VFX artists have gone through and fixed it. Because you just you don't feel any realistic weight with the way that he just snaps back up after landing on the ground. This they were able to have the, I guess, realism in that. But the physics of it were off. And this is the exact opposite. The physics are incredible. They just don't necessarily have the processing power. And it's interesting to me. The shots that they chose to do CG in this it tends to be a lot of the action scenes. But some of the horror scenes early on with Doc Ock, like the operating room scene specifically, that I think is mostly practical effects and it looks yeah. terrific. There's some kind of like, there's a campiness that really plays and it makes it silly at the same time that it's scary. And it's so distinctly Sam Raimi. You can really feel that evil dead energy in there. And I was thinking about multiverse of madness and trying to figure out, you know, this is the same guy. This is the same guy 20 years later. Why isn't there more of that energy? And I think it's just that so much more in Multiverse of Madness was CG. And maybe it's that it opens up more possibilities with, like you mentioned, the blocking. Like now, because they can do so much more, they have the option to show so much more in the shot and position I position things wherever they want and pull off whatever they want to make it look realistic, where I really wish they would have brought more practical effect energy into Multiverse of Madness. I think I would have really liked it more. It's it's less focused in multiverse of madness because it's the yeah. entire world whereas in this it's doc ock fighting spider-man in i think maybe the best fight scene of spider-man's of spider-man in movies that yeah. we've seen i think it's the best him catching the train is probably the best feat that spider-man has accomplished in any of the movies i was watching this video online where this guy is like calculating who's the strongest Spider-Man. And he ended up with Tom Holland because the feat of holding the Staten Island ferry together (laughs) is, is more takes more strength 
than stopping the train. Huh. And I doesn't feel like that, though. No, it, not at all. That was cool. I liked it. No complaints about that. Very fun. Tom Holland's great. Him stopping the train is the most Spider-Man thing. It's so good for his character. The moment with the people in the city and realizing he's a kid and just that whole all the storytelling there. Him, the the citizens standing at Joey Diaz standing <laughs> up to <die. laughs> two Sopranos in this movie. There are two Sopranos in this movie. There's the dude when uh, the door opens. When Peter's landlord is hounding him for rent, he's playing cards. One of the dudes at that table is uh, Joey Diaz's FBI contact from the Sopranos <laughs> season, I think, too. He's just playing cards. Bones is in this. Uh, the yeah. dude from Lost is in this. There's like a bunch of fun, <laughs> random cameos <laughs> in this that are great. That aren't cameos. They're just actors. <laughs> actors succeeded after this movie was made. And it's great to watch now. And. Yeah, I thought that I think that scene is may, maybe one of the maybe the best Spider-Man scene in Spider-Man cinema. It's right up there. I was thinking for comparison, I was trying to think of like the best iconic scenes in the Spider-Man movies. And mm-hmm. I think it's the train and I think it's the Gwen Stacy catch. Yeah. And I think between the two, those are the most those are just the most iconic imagery standpoint, especially in the most recent Spider-Man film where they call back the catch. That was like the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I didn't realize I was going to have such an emotional response to recreating that scene. I don't know how you recreate the train. I guess maybe the Staten Island thing was an attempt at recreating the train scene, but man, it's great. And even him falling and the, and the people on the train catching him, dude, that whole thing was great. His fight with Doc Ock looks amazing. It's brutal. They're, they're bawling at each other. One thing that I think is a glaring red flag in this, which is that Doc Ock is just a guy with tentacles, right? He's a human being and Spider-Man punches him in the face a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Spider-Man beats the crap out of this regular guy, but it doesn't affect him, right? He, He's. He's not a super strong human being. His tentacles are his power. So he there really is a lot of defense on his part where he is trying to prevent Spider-Man from getting to this soft, gushy core of Doc Ock. I feel like many a Doc Ock encounter ended with Peter or Spider-Man finally landing a blow on Doc Ock as a person. Right. Or finally getting to hit the human part and getting through the tentacles or stopping the tentacles so you can get to the human <laughs> part. Like that's like the gushy center of Doc Ock is kind of a big element of the character. And there's no way that Spider-Man could punch him in the face five times and just not <laughs> instantly knock this guy out. There's, it's impossible. Dude. I get it. It's it looks better for the movie. It looks great. It makes no canonical sense. It makes no sense in the entire movie. I really want to go back and watch. What was, what was the most recent one called? Oh, my God. A blanket. On no it. way home. No way home. How Doc Ock fights in that. Oh, yeah. Because I'd be curious to see if how many times he gets punched in the face by a Spider-Man in that movie compared to this one. Because I think it's 20 to zip. I don't think, I don't think Doc Ock's getting punched in the face that much in the recent one. Uh, but he gets... Man, he gets smacked around in this like <laughs> I'll give you a canonical like, reason. I'll tell you exactly why he got or why he got punched okay. so many times. Go for it. Somebody noticed that in Spider-Man Homecoming, Tom Holland's Peter Parker was not throwing any punches. He does not throw a single punch at a human being in the movie. It's because it's easier to regulate how much force you're using with your legs than it is with your arms. And he's so new to his powers that he doesn't want to accidentally kill someone with a punch. So he's kicking the entire movie. You can go back, watch it. It's fascinating. They never call attention to it, but they're right. Um, This Peter Parker knows who Doc Ock is. He has a personal connection to Otto Octavius before he becomes Doc Ock. I think he's trying to figure out how hard he can punch him to not knock his fucking head off. I think he's so worried (laughs) that he's going to use a little bit too much. He's just going to absolutely murder someone. Yeah, I I do like that. I think that's a general consensus on Spider-Man, right? There's Mm -hmm. that great arc with him. Maybe the most iconic. Well, one of the most iconic 
uh, arcs with him and, and Doc Ock is spectacular spider Spider-Man, right? Is it spectacular? Oh no. Superior. superior Spider-Man. Yeah. Where Doc Ock takes over. Doc Ock takes over his body. And the first thing Doc Ock does is fight the scorpion and just knock the scorpion's face off. Mm. <laughs> and, and he's controlling Peter Parker's body. And he realizes that Peter Parker must be holding back all the time or he would have killed all these guys. And it's really incredible character work in that where we're seeing that every time. Why is he struggling with some guys and not with uh, and why is he struggling with everybody when he's clearly in different power classes with these guys? And it's because he's not trying to hurt them. Yeah. Peter would love to help these guys. I think Spider-Man as a character would prefer to help the bad guys as opposed to hurt them and beat them up, which is, I, I think, a good deviation from other characters. His ideal scenario would be what he did in uh, No Way Home, where it is finding solutions to solve these guys problem and getting them rehabbed and helping them out. Definitely. Uh, and I think that's great. I think it's just great character work. And I think that's probably part of it. I think that's the justification. I also think probably it looks better. It looks great that he's getting punched. <laughs> it looks so cool. Maybe that's part of it. Who knows? Uh, I what do you think of MJ in this? Oh boy. I think MJ is kind of a Brad Pitt figure in that, or who would no, know Henry Cavill is the person that we talked about this with. I think she's kind of a Henry Cavill figure sure. in that she's someone that happens to be very attractive, but is at their core a big weirdo because I can't <laughs> think of any other reason that she would be pining after this version of Peter Parker, who is, the biggest weirdo of all of the Peter Parkers. This is a strange guy. Like this is an extremely, extremely awkward guy. The girl that lives in his apartment building is probably the girl that this Peter Parker yeah. should be dating. Cause she's also <laughs> very awkward and geeky. And then Mary Jane's face is on billboards. And yet she's like, Oh, Peter, the weirdo next door. That's who I want. I started watching the third one after the second one. And the first thing is him going to her musical. And he, she's like, oh, the laughs weren't that loud. And he's like, well, actually, the sound waves diffracted. And he like starts going on this thing and she goes, you're such a nerd and kisses oh him. God. And I'm like, this whole relationship is a lie. This doesn't make any sense at all. Why are they into each other? It makes so much sense that Tom Holland and Zendaya are together. They're both making MJ so weird. Mm -hmm. As Zendaya is perfect. They're both. They have common interests. Yeah. They both like similar stuff. They you can see them as friends. And I don't see either of them together at all. And it's also understandably a lot to be dating Spider-Man. And I think it's very maybe it's just kids being dumb. Probably her being like, yeah, it's OK. Be Spider-Man. And then in Spider-Man three, it's like, hey, I really don't like that. You're also Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we all signed up for this. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think her character is a little shallower than I remembered it being mm -hmm. as is um, Harry. Yeah, I think Harry's pretty one dimensional, but I was also kind of shocked at how decent he was. Like, I guess I don't think of, Oh my God, why am I black? I'm so bad at names. James now. Franco. <laughs> James Franco. I guess I was shocked at how believable James James Franco is as this guy and how I didn't blink at it when now I'm just he's just a crazy stoner comedy guy. I guess the idea that he's playing this pretty straight laced character in a major film seems weird now. Am I am I crazy? He's he's quote unquote straight laced, but he's playing Harry Osborne like a mafia don. He's yeah. playing him like somebody in the Goodfellas. He has the line in this. He disrespected me by touching me. It just feels like the kind of thing <laughs> you would hear De Niro say when he's ordering a hit on someone. <laughs> and then he puts on these like, I think like these Gucci sunglasses. And it's who is this guy? I guess he's super rich and he's in New York and he's wearing these suits. Maybe that's who he thinks he is. We already know there's two <laughs> Sopranos in this movie. Maybe Harry was connected, dude. Yeah, he's doing his thing for sure. The, the butler is giving me advice like your father oh only God, agonized dude. over work. Oh, my God. Not people. And it was like, yeah, I guess. 
<laughs> cool, man. What's that guy's name again? Great. What's the butler's name? Do you remember? Oh my god, it's a great name. Oh, I'm blanking on it. It's like it's Jasper, such a good isn't it? butler name. Yeah, I want to say it's like a Jasper, like a oh, like an H. God, he is he's so funny. Wait, this can't and be right. I pulled a Bernard Houseman. That cannot be the guy's name. <laughs> I don't think that's right at all. I think that was uh, uh, Waller Bridges' character in Indiana Jones. <laughs> Just a completely unusable yeah. name. Uh, Kevin, while we're while we're getting to the end, got a question for you. Hit me, Tim. Is Spider Man Two better or worse than Spider Man Across the Spider Verse? Oh, it's better than Across the Spider Verse, no question. It's definitely better. Oh yeah, mm, better or worse than Batman nineteen eighty nine. I knew you were going to bring this up, and this yeah. sucks. Yeah, this truly sucks. I think Batman nineteen eighty nine is better. I definitely think. I think it is better. I think I, but I don't know. I I feel very biased, but I think nineteen eighty nine is a full thing. <sighs> is more rewatchable as depressing as 1989 is this movie is still a bummer for a while. <laughs> I don't know. Peter Parker <laughs> takes L's for the first 20 minutes of this movie so much. it's like he lives in Manhattan and he's commuting to Williamsburg because it is L after L after L that's a little joke <laughs> for the New York audience <laughs> He gets up, he gets on the L train and he doesn't get off. <laughs> He's he has to take pictures of his dream girl getting married. Wow. That sucks. What are the odds of that? I am spit are on the, the odds? water. Good God. <laughs> and then they just make an announcement. Well, Mary Jane just agreed to marry me. And it's like, I don't know, has she met your parents at all? Like, what? <laughs> it just seems so random. Makes no sense. And now he has to take her picture. Oh, crazy. Also weird that she just stands this guy up. The, as as far as we know, the astronaut dude is a good guy. Sure. And she is just messing with him hardcore. Yeah, usually we would get some kind of a scene where we see that he's like mean to a waiter. Yeah, like he hits somebody. Yeah. But in this, he's just he's worried about her. He cares about her. She kisses him upside down and he's like, wow, I'm in the star. Like, he just seems like a great dude who's really into her. Yeah. And she's like, "Nah, I want this weirdo who's also Spider-Man that is definitely going to upset me in a little while. I, I don't know. And OK, I do also think it's so funny that he comes home and his surprise party is just Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Jane and Aunt May. That's the weirdest part of this oh whole movie. God. That is crazy. Oh. Don't don't even have a surprise. Just get a lunch or something. I don't know. That seems that's devastating if I'm Peter Parker. That's a co-worker party, dude. That is a work <laughs> birthday party right there. <laughs> oh man. Is this better or worse oh, than wow. Bali 2? This is Oh, this is hard near the top. It's real hard. I think it's I think it's better than Bahu Bali 2. I think so. But it's a horse race Good because Bahu Bali 2 is a throw rod. And maybe that's a recency bias. I mean, this is Spider-Man 2. I'm also this entire time I've been trying to parse out the fact that I've probably seen this movie 20 times and how much of it is just I'm so familiar with it at this point. Yeah. And then I put it uh, below Gardens of the Galaxy Volume Three because just mm, an executive decision. No, mm, gonna need to <laughs> gonna need to fight you on that one. <laughs> yeah, eventually we'll come to blows over that. Something we'll we'll see if Spider Man Two makes the top five and review preview. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll hash it up then. Spoiler alert! Yeah. It's in there. <laughs> Guardians Three in the top five. Are you out of oh, your man, damn mind, sure. Tim? For sure. On, I was thinking top five <sighs> best this year. Sisu. We didn't cover Sisu, but I think it's up there for me, too. I checked that I out. Saw it. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. yeah, I know you and Spencer saw it, but I got to check that one out. It's, people are saying it's great. Yeah. People of the pod, what do you think? Is Tim insane for having Guardians 3 <laughs> in the top five? Please write in and say, yes, I need your backing on this. Nerdy430 at gmail.com. 
Uh, also, go to nerdyfor30.com. It's our Substack sign up. It's totally free. We don't have a paywall on there. We're sending you a newsletter with some personal recs from me and Tim every week. It's a little gift from us to you. If you like what you hear, share this pod with one person. Get a little groundswell going. Just pick one person one. you think would like it. <laughs> share it to them. We'll be here again next week. Same time, same place. Till then, stay nerdy, everybody. Stay nerdy, everybody. Bye. Bye.